Hi, everyone. My name is Dan Carmody, and I'm the executive director of Tresolution. And in this episode of FinTech Intellects, in-depth conversations, really pleased to have Brian Barnes, who is the founder and CEO of a great app, M1 Finance, join us today. So thank you, Brian, for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Brian, tell me a little bit more about M1 Finance and, and what you do for the company. Um, so what I do is I was the, the founder and CEO, so you know, probably more influential earlier, and now I just ask other people to do things. But uh, M1 Finance is a personal finance platform. We offer three main products. Uh, the first one is M1 Invest, that is free automated investing in a custom stock or ETF portfolio. We have M1 Borrow, which is a portfolio line of credit where you can borrow against your M1 Invest portfolio at rates as low as 2%. And then we have M1 Spend, which is a high yield checking account, a checking account that gives you 1% interest on checking, 1% cash back on an M1 debit card. And it moves into this comprehensive platform where you can replace your checking account, sweep money into a custom portfolio of the investments you want for free and borrow at one of the lowest interest rates on the market. That's, that's amazing. It seems like a full, an all encompassing financial solution. Is, is, is that what you intended to build when you, when you first started M1 Finance? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we do call it the finance super app and in some sense we are trying to manage all of the customers or users finances on one digital platform, as opposed to putting together a bunch of point solutions here and there. I would say the sort of genesis for M1 was more on the invest side and it very quickly morphed into this all encompassing solution where, you know, you're, the, the user wants to manage their money. They don't want to just manage a component of it. And so we really want to give the, the platform, the tool where you go to manage all of your money in very intuitive, seamless, low cost ways. That's great. So, so you, you, you said first you, you started on the investing side. How were you able to get the feedback from your customers to know that they had other demands or, or other requirements that you could fill through like the money movement and, and money management side? Yeah, so I think like, you know, in a startup, especially in a heavily regulated space, it is going to be a combination of vision of what you ultimately want to build long term, as well as responding to customer feedback and, and in a sense, seeing whether you're fulfilling on that vision. In some sense, what we started with was more a manifestation of the personal finance or investing account that I wanted, that wish existed on the marketplace and thought, you know, if I want something like this, there would be other people too. And so it was a little bit more conviction led than, than feedback led. And we really took a premise that people need fantastic finance tools now, they'll need it five years from now, they'll need it 15 years from now, they'll need it, you know, hundred years from now. And there are some principles of, ease of use, simplicity, lower cost, automation that never go away. And so if you're able to deliver a incredible money management experience, it's sort of, you know, a anticipation that there's always a market for something like that. Sure. So you said uh, you, you've had an interest in finance for a while, obviously. How, how did that, how did that start? Uh, it was really started in the home uh, growing up as in, in childhood that parents were both in business and uh, just introduced me to business, the notion of investing at a pretty young age. And so they showed me what a brokerage account was sort of 10, 11 years old and said, hey, if this interests you, you can dig in, you can learn more, you can you know, do it under the purview of, of my parents. If it doesn't, you need to learn the basics. And from a very young age, I was just immediately captivated by the notion of, in, of investing, that it was this you know, super hairy intellectual puzzle of, you know, here's a company operating in a complex world, What's it worth? What are the competitive advantages? And then you're just to be clear, this is this is all at ten years old. You know, I, I think my like <laughs> my uh, thinking likely or hopefully progressed. I don't think I peaked at ten, um, <laughs> but it, it, it was much more of a. I, I was a curious kid who like liked puzzles, and I viewed investing in a company as this ultimate puzzle, and you were making a bet behind it. And so, from a kid, it was you know do this puzzle as well as try to make money. And so those were the two things that, you know, just like lit my eyes up and, and you know, got really into investing and, and just ha did that middle school, high school into college. And, and that was where I developed the, the passion and became, you know, sort of finance nerd about it. <laughs> sure. So, so let's talk a little bit about college. You, you went to Stanford, got a degree in economics, if I'm not mistaken. Was it a, a second degree in math or, in, or, or what it was, was, was it? Minor in math. A so. minor in math. Okay, yep. great. And, and then you, you graduated. 
three years later, you started M1 Finance. So can you tell us a little bit about um, that whole process? Did you graduate knowing you wanted to start a fintech company? And uh, what was that three years like between graduation and, and the launch of, of M1? Um, no. So, the, I mean, the quick answer is no, I did not graduate knowing I wanted to do a, a finance or fintech company. Um, if anything, while I was at Stanford, I was, you know, in the heart of the beast, the belly of the beast with Silicon Valley and what was going on from a startup landscape. And truthfully, my entire time there, I was a little bit eye roly and you know, like, uh, did, did, didn't think super highly of it. And, and if anything, wanted to go to the more like established elite, you know, work for a big corporation type thing. Um, did the econ and math and then did a short stint at a hedge fund doing equity research for them and, you know, uh, like sort of pursued the, the investing path and then worked at a management consulting firm. And it was getting in there and realizing the, the slow progression of corporate hierarchy. Uh, it was, I, I, I sort of saw what the people saw in startups of the ability to sort of put your product or put your work on display and letting the market decide what it was worth. And so I think it was, you know, had this entry level job that was good training ground, gave me a lot of exposure, but in there very quickly realized I wanted to do something with, I don't know if it's just more risk attached or more, you know, putting forth my effort and letting the world decide rather than a promotion in two years. It, it just, that didn't seem super exciting from a, you know, career progression standpoint. And so, you know, left the consulting job, knew I wanted to do something more entrepreneurial. Uh, I actually sat down every day with a stack of textbooks and, and started to teach myself to code. And so, you know, started with uh, the front end and moved through the back end from different coding principles and paradigms and languages and whatnot. Uh, and then it was really in the management of my own money of saying, you know, hey, I see what's out there. I think I can create something better. I see the new players. I, you know, probably hubristically or naively thought, you know, could definitely create something better and uh, ultimately went for it. And here we are five years later. Very cool. So would you consider coding a, a critical component of someone who wants to go into finance nowadays? Um, I, I don't know if you need to be able to code. I think you're at a massive disadvantage if you don't know the underlying principles or structures of it that I think broadly speaking, there's sort of a, a long trend towards automation where computers used to automate really basic tasks that humans did. And so it could do, you know, really basic things, but just over and over and over again, much faster than a computer. Now they're beginning to automate more and more complex tasks. And I think over time, they'll be able to automate pretty complicated tasks, if not, you know, very human intellectual tasks. And so I think not having an understanding of sort of that digital ecosystem, how things are given, puts you at a pretty significant disadvantage. And, you know, even, even broadly, like, my role, I'm not coding uh, for M1. None of my code would make, you know, would pass production level quality that, that we demand can run SQL queries and run analyses on my own. And it, it does just give you this fundamental lever of power that you don't have if you don't know the, the, the underlying principles. So uh, as an entrepreneur myself, I can remember the day where I decided to start my own company. Uh, is there one day, was there one catalyst that, that sticks out in your mind as to you're sitting there uh, saying, that's it, I'm, I'm going to do it. Did, did anything like that happen for you? You know, it, it was, I don't know if there was one day. I, I might be able to describe it to one day because I, you know, sat down with the coding stuff and was managing my own personal finances and, and sort of got back into it, you know, wasn't able to do it when I was at the hedge fund or consulting firm and, and really, you know, got back to it and, and thoroughly enjoyed doing it, but was massively underwhelmed with the tools that were out there. And so ideas started percolating of, you know, hey, if I could create the best tool for me, what would it look like? And it was, you know, the, the benefit of going to Stanford is you meet a lot of other entrepreneurial people, some of which have been quite successful. And, you know, one of my good friends was one of those wonder kid, early successful people. And it was in talking with him um, and him saying, you should do this. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you, you have the passion, you have the intellect, you have the, the drive, like, you know, it might fail, but you should absolutely pursue it. And it was, you know, in that conversation decided to sort of take the lead. Very cool. So you're based here in Chicago. Um, it's interesting. You went to school, out, out west could have very easily have stayed out west what's it like 
doing a startup, a fintech in the Chicagoland market? Yeah, so Chicagoland is home for me. So I grew up in Naperville and really wanted to come home and you know, thoroughly enjoyed being here. And, and truthfully, like Chicago has a absolutely fantastic finance history with all the CBOE and mercantile exchange and you know all, all that. And then Options Express was started here. Braintree was here. We have a lot of fintech presence in Chicago. And so there, I do think it's a top tier city to, to start a fintech company. Broadly speaking, we were going to the you know, creating a consumer facing application. And I do think in the Valley, there's a little bit of, it needs to take over the world in one or two years or else let it die. And I think most finance firms, the successful ones today are large because they've compounded for incredibly long periods of time. And so I thought that there was a little bit of benefit from being away from that mentality, that culture, that ecosystem and taking a longer term approach of, hey, it's going to take us a year to get through the regulatory process. It's probably going to take us another six months to iron out the kinks. It's going to take a while for people to learn about the app and put, you know, try it out and, and have us continue to build. And then we're asking people to hand over their life savings, which is also a long-term process. And so having a area where it was a little bit removed from the like boom and bust cycle of the hot startup of the day, I think was a huge benefit for how my mind works and how I wanted to build the company. So I, I think that's interesting. Like, can we dive into the details a little bit on the regulatory side? So you, you're working in a highly regulatory environment um, with personal finance. Uh, what was that like? How do you go from, from launching and then tackling the regulatory requirements on top of it? Because I presume you needed to address that first before you could get customers, right? So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yep, absolutely. So we have the three main products, invest, borrow, spend. Invest and borrow are run through our broker dealer. And so we had to become a broker dealer prior to going and even talking about it with clients. And then on the spend side, we partnered with a bank, but that was a product that was recently released. So on the broker dealer side of the world, we're regulated by FINRA, which is overseen by the SEC. And it is something that you need to become a broker dealer prior to advertising your product prior to getting customer feedback, prior to being able to buy a security on a customer's behalf. And so that is a year long, they say it's a six month application process. It's probably closer to nine to 12 months, but you know, it's that from an application process once things are submitted. And once you're in the door, you have to prove that you have uh, a balance sheet to support another year of business without any revenue coming in. And so sort of coming to the table, you have to say, I have two years of balance sheet, I have a plan to get through the regulatory process in conjunction with building everything that you need to, to launch a product to the, the public. So it is a pretty heavy lift. It's, it's like financial services, especially in the, the broker dealer space is not something that two people in a garage can create. You do need to have upfront capital. You need to have a long-term plan. You need to come to the table with, um, yeah, and I mean, it's you, you can't even throw out an MVP. You're dealing with people's money. It has to be perfect. So the, the bar is, I think, considerably higher for creating an application from the get-go. Sure. So, I'm, I mean, I would imagine that's a pretty wide moat then for people and organizations that are able to establish in that space. It is a wide moat. I joke that while I was not a broker dealer, I wanted them to lower the barriers. And now, now that I'm on the other side, I want them to be <laughs> increased that, you know, it like, yeah, there are pros and cons of being regulated. It does make you up your game from the beginning, which I think there are benefits, but yeah, there are some friction filled activities that uh, you would otherwise not take on if you were just sort of a standard startup creating a consumer application. Sure. All right. So let's talk in general, not necessarily uh, consumer finance or, or broker dealer, but, but fintech in general, right? Uh, do you have any advice or any kind of guidance that you might give to someone who is looking to start their own fintech related company? So if you're starting your own, I do think you need to think incredibly long-term that, but have short-term milestones that you need to hit to be able to be funded along that journey, that you're not gonna be able to conquer the world sort of minute one, but you do need to have a big audacious plan and deliver value over time where there's success at each milestone. Um, personal finance, investing, you know, whatever it may be, just money management in general is such a large marketplace and there are giant firms. And so you will get the benefit. No one will question how big the market can be, how big your company can be. If you do well, 
you're going to be a large uh, company, but it's going to be more time intensive, more expensive, have additional burdens put on. And so you do have to be a little bit more structured from the get go. Um, I think there's a lot of ways to do entrepreneurship. You know, one is to start something from scratch and, you know, try to go raise the money, build it yourself and, and take on all the risk. There's also joining small companies that, you know, are in the progression of getting bigger, whether that's, you know, pre-products, pre-revenue, pre, you know, or like even launching their second product and, and trying to scale that. You can get a lot of the ownership, the buy-in, the risk, the ability to, you know, create something from scratch uh, with, not being the sole entrepreneur in, in the broader landscape as well. Sure. Yeah, that's that's great advice. I mean, you don't have to you don't have to start from step one. You could start at step three, and maybe see that venture through, and then maybe the next time you you, you decide to start at step one. Uh, Lives are long. Yeah, you'll have you'll have definitely have a couple of bats and learn a whole lot on every uh, every aspect of the journey. Sure. So uh, you've had a couple of really successful rounds of, of raising funds, I believe a series A and, and, and a series B back in June, if I'm not mistaken. That's Can correct. you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, you know, in, in the progression, we were fortunate enough to actually raise a relatively large seed round. So that was 9 million. The series A was 12 and a half. And then we recently closed on a $33 million series B. And as the progression goes, it's, you know, really, in the early stages, it's buying on team, idea, ability to execute, and providing the business with the capitalization that it needs to hit various milestones along the way. And then as you mature in the organization, it's much more driven on results. And so, you know, the, the seed was better or worse conviction on me, conviction on the, the team that I had uh, built and assembled, and then the general idea of where we were going. Series A, we had the product in market. We probably had $100 million on the platform. And so, you know, starting to show early traction. And then the B, we passed a billion dollars on the platform in February. And so, you know, we had, like, to use the startup jargon, real product market fit, and people were trusting, entrusting us with their life savings. You know, people bring over multi hundred thousand dollar accounts, million dollars accounts from Fidelity, Ameritrade, E-Trade, Schwab, you know, the, the big incumbents. And there was, you know, investors look at that and say, hey, if you've done that with a short amount of time, you know, mediocre budget, relatively speaking, and are able to get people's life savings, you're definitely onto something. And, you know, we, we also have a business model and are making revenue and, and the like. And so it's uh, definitely, it, the, the progression goes more to the fundamentals of the business and how it's performing. I see. So, so I, I'm, I'm interested when you were uh, conceptually talking about the seed round, uh, what was your communication tactics like? Like how, what strategies did you use to, to talk about where your vision for M1 was going uh, to the point to where investors bought in uh, literally and, and decided to uh, fund you at the seed level? Yeah, I think the funny thing is I would, like it, when I thought at the time, you know, it was creating the world's best presentations. It was such an obvious no brainer. I'm sure that like led to overconfidence and hubris and sort of going into those presentations. When I look back, the presentations are awful. So I don't know, you know, <laughs> I like can't really gauge how the presentation alongside my written work was. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think we always approach things from a fundamental perspective that, you know, people will need to manage money for all the time. So it's an evergreen market. They will always be interested in the best tools, the, and you know, whatever categorization you sort of define best in, and there's different wants and needs and a little bit of a assumption that, you know, in, I started this in, in 2015, 2015, the, the set of possibilities of what you could create in a finance firm was dramatically different than what a finance firm could be created in 1870, which is when most of them actually were, or, you know, 1960 when all the like, or seventies when Schwab and Vanguard were created. And so I think there was a inherent belief that someone can create a next generation financial institution. It can be built on different principles that are fundamental to how people want to manage their money moving forward. And I think I just delivered a very straightforward path of, you know, what we're going to build, how we're going to build it, how it was different, why it was wanted from the, the customers and the like, and people were willing to, you know, to place a, place a bet behind that. 
Well, it seems like they've probably made a good decision, I'm guessing, because uh, what, just a couple of weeks ago, you announced, uh, I think, greater than 2 billion AUM, if I'm not mistaken. So yep. Yeah, so we launched to the public three and a half years ago. It took us three years to get to the first billion, six months to get to the second billion. Uh, our investors are happy. They, you know, the early investors have made many multiples on their money. And then, uh, so we just closed on our series B and, and we will likely have something else coming out in the not too distant future. Very exciting, exciting stuff. Let's talk about the future a little bit. Um, one, the future of M1 in, in, in five and 10 and 15 years from now, can you paint a picture as to where you would like to see you know, your solution, your company be at that point in time? Yeah, I think we, at M1, we probably focus on three main things. And so the, the, the first is we focus on the holistic nature of your finances. We don't want to be a point solution for one aspect. We want you to come to M1 and manage your money in all respects. And we think that there's benefits to managing it on one platform as opposed to putting things together. We then focus very heavily on personalization. And so how people manage their money is pretty unique and specific to them. And so how you earn money is different, how you spend money is different, how you invest is, is different, why you might want to borrow. And so we very much focus on, hey, can we create a customizable tool to empower you to manage the finances how you want? And then we really focus on optimization and automation. So every dollar, how can it be, you know, if it's into the M1 platform, seamlessly, effortlessly, costlessly put to its best use. And so, you know, every dollar that comes in, every dollar that comes out, how can the software take over to automate all the things so that your, your finances are just in the background, optimized to your heart's content. And so, you know, that, that's the, the general principles that we like to espouse and, and build towards. And if we talk about what we're going to be building long-term, I think M1 will have every product feature in a different domain that you would expect from a big bank, a big brokerage, a big asset manager and the like. Um, that being said, I, it will never be, you know, two products under the same brand umbrella where they feel like very different products, probably built up via acquisition. We focus on the integration and the automation between the two. And so, you know, the, the, the perfect example is the invest borrow, you know, if you invest with us, can we let you borrow for cheaper? And we, we focus on, sort of, you know, you diff have different pockets of your money, but how do you think of it in the whole? And how do you sort of leverage all aspects of your finances to manage it more intelligently? Great. So on, on a more macro level, above and beyond just, just them one, are there any overarching trends, uh, things that you're really interested in the fintech space uh, that you would like to talk about or, or things that you're, you're, you're sort of keeping an eye on? Yeah, I think the... Um, for us, I think there's two, oh, maybe, maybe definitely more than two, but a lot of big trends. And, and <laughs> what, what we focus just on, two. I think, that's it. <laughs> just two. There's two, and, and M1's <laughs> perfecting both. Um, no, so the, the first is the general rebundling of the application or bank. And so I think for a while, there was an unbundling where you know one company would sort of pick off one component of a um, you know, bank and what they offered in auto loans. And then it says, hey, they focus 5% of their energy towards auto loans. If we focus 100%, we can do it better. And they create a better auto loan product. And then, you know, I think they did that. And there was a progression. Now everybody has 14 finance related apps on their phone and they have a folder and they're managing their money across everything. And, you know, new things are coming out and it's just, it's too noisy. And I think there's a broader trend towards rebundling and, and saying, you know, Hey, if you spend your money and we manage your income and we manage how you spend money, can we better underwrite you from an auto loan perspective? And so it says, you know, if you bank with us, can we actually provide something that, you know, a sole auto loan company providing in isolation couldn't provide? And so I think there's a broad trend towards that rebundling, the integration, you know, in some sense, the holy grail is that finance super app that does everything perfectly. The other is just generally the demographics that people are going for. And so you have a lot of fintech companies going after the unbanked, the underbanked. Um, and, you know, these are people who the big financial institutions have generally overlooked. And so, you know, I think that's like the, the quote is democratizing access and, you know, everyone will talk about how they're democratizing and a big benefit, like people 
you, you can serve with a digital product much more people than you could serve sort of like doing hand-to-hand -hand combat or you know having everybody have an advisor or whatnot so you know there is a democratization of access well listen brian i i appreciate you making the time to to talk with me today about m1 finance your opinions on on fintech some of the backstory before you started the company i think that's really interesting uh and the fact that you started looking at stocks at 10 that's that's pretty amazing Right, so I, I have to owe a lot to my parents. They, ab you know, absolutely, they, they I was just going to say curiosity that has paid dividends. <laughs> that, that's right, and 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 that's great that they were able to 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 see that you had an interest in that and and to try to foster that. Right, so that's that's awesome. So, well, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for talking with me today, and uh, and I hope you I hope you have a great day, Brian. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Take care.